Welcome to the Backstage Supercast with Freak Bass and Rexhibition. Boy, howdy, everybody, and welcome to the Backstage Supercast, your cutting edge on the newest, absolute, incredibly uh, timeliest tip humanly possible. I am Rexavision, uh, joined by my incredibly talented, super cool co-host. They call me Freak Bass. They call him Freak Bass. And they call him Freak Bass for a pretty good reason, because he's freaky and he plays the bass freakily well. I think that that is why they call you that, right? Yes, and I'm still uh, working on the follow-up novel, as we discussed in the last show, of Bass Freak, my counter-alter ego. I'm going to run with that, I think. Yes. Ha-ha. I think uh, you're going to have to write that. That's going to be the comic you're going to have to write, though, Rex. Just give me uh, heads Yeah, up. that's going to go uh, number four in the queue, because uh, I got, like, yeah, that thing I'm working on in the background, whoo, kicking my butt. But uh, bet. enough about our travails. Uh, today we're going to talk real quick about a thing or two, but then we are going to get to the heart of the order, the reason for the season, the brand new damn uh, incredible Spider-Man Far From Home. Yes, and I'm so glad you, you saw it when we originally first talked about doing this show. Um, you weren't sure if you were going to make it before this week's show, and I was. it was going to be kind of a half spoiler show i was going to spoil you and i was like i don't i felt really awkward about that so i'm really uh super happy that and plus just to hear your insights on it too on anything else so i'm just really excited that we uh, get to uh discuss in depth of this amazing movie i you know i gotta tell you i went full geek i took notes during the movie from ambient light Wow, that is full geek man. I'm 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 impressed, dude. That's like let's just like the guys that go to the ballpark and actually do the box scores during the red, you know, during the baseball games. And uh, that's you're on that level, and that, uh, that's very impressive. Well, I got to tell you, I, I sort of got shamed into it. One of my music friends, uh, I was I was talking to them, and they were talking about how they love to live tweet the set lists, you know, uh-huh. when they go to concerts, and I'm like. Damn, all right, that's pretty. And I was like, I can't live tweet the movie because that'll just piss everybody off. But right. but I can just take some notes and be that much more ready. So I did what I could. I, I got a couple of weird looks, but I wasn't really bothering anybody. I didn't have a light on, so everybody shut right, up. Good. Anyway, you had a, a couple of, like a breaking story for yeah, us, Yeah, just, just a quick, couple quick news. Before we get into Spider-Man, let's just do a couple quick uh, news items. The one um, is pretty cool. This is broke in the last couple of days, um, I think, so maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, or excuse me, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, it looks like the Flash movie, which you and I kind of discussed a little bit on our last show, um, it looks like they got a new director. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. It's Andy Mush- Muschietti. Um, who did was a director of the the It movies, the Stephen King It movies, and so uh, that was cool news. It sounds the other cool news in that in that article, if you read it, it sounds like that they're going to keep Ezra Miller. So it's not like they're going in a whole different direction. They're keeping Ezra Miller as uh, Flash and Barry Allen, which is great. And uh, in my opinion, it is because I think he could he's going to be really good. And it sounds like just from reading between the lines from the director that they're hiring and also uh kind of the input that ezra was trying to uh, like uh put in there it sounds like they're going to go in more of kind of a a little bit more serious direction not so kind of comical i.e justice leaguey uh version of of barry allen but yeah a little bit more on the serious tip which which i think will be good as well so um you know it's still you know in semi-developmental stage I'm still a little bit, uh, I'll believe it all when I see it, because they. I think this is like the third or fourth director that they've gone to. Um, so let, let's kind of keep our fingers crossed and uh, see see what happens. But what do, you, what do you think about that news? I mean, I want a Flash movie. I'm on record. I will say that I, can't, I definitely agree that, uh, whereas I like Ezra Miller in the role, I, I, I did not like the overall portrayal of the flash and the thing I don't mind flash cracking a couple of jokes and I, I, I don't even really mind the Flash's socially awkward thing. Cause that, that sort of chimes in with the comics. But one thing, you know, the, the flash is a scientist, you know, like right. one of the, uh, the best things about the flash was that he always beat his villains. You know, first of all, Surprisingly, he always managed to come up with a way that running really fast would solve the problem, which is, sure. you know, just a great, uh, a great trick. But the other thing is that, you know, they used to call them flash facts. Like they would have like little panels, 
like in the middle of a, a, an action sequence where like it would just be a drawing of the Flash's head where he would explain some weird uh, semi-obscure scientific fact, you know, as he was like, you know, I'm going to run super fast in this direction. And then the Flash would be like creating a counter vortex to Cyclones. Right, as well. right. And it's like, okay, like, you know, you got cool superhero action and you got some bullshit that you could probably throw into it. I learned almost all of my scientific knowledge from comic books, you know, at yeah. first when I was a kid and you sure. know, they, they actually cared about, you know, like back in the day, they cared about making some of that shit right. So, right, right, right. you know, you, you, I, I mean, there was no fake news back then. And I mean, comic books were more trustable than like the actual news programs of today, you know, sure. Well, let's do. Uh, let, let, let's kind of. Move. We won't get too heavy. Yeah, into no, no, no. Just yeah. That, but I just want to say, let's definitely uh, plan on a flash deep dive because I have uh, you know, talking about the movie and also within the comics. I have a lot of questions. Actually, I know you're you're really uh, up on it. I want to actually throw at you about my questions about what they could possibly <laughs> do with this movie, and hopefully by the next time <laughs> we do that, uh, they'll have some. There'll be some more news on that front. But the other the other news is. Um, uh, real quickly is uh, it sounds like we have some possible Catwoman casting news. It sounds like it's kind of going around on some different blog sites. Um, I think Geeks Worldwide, which is you know they've broken a few little stories here and there, but um, uh, that the the rumor is is that Vanessa Kirby is in the running for the new Catwoman. And uh, for those of you who don't know who she is, uh, she was in the uh, the latest Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible Fallout film. I know her from, there's a show on Netflix called The Crown, and uh, she plays Princess Margaret on, oh. on The Crown. And, and yeah, and I, she is, if they do go with her, I think that will be genius for, for Catwoman. I, I'm really excited. She's edgy. She's, um, you know, she's got that kind of sultry thing about her, too, as well. Like, you're not quite, a, even like in Mission Impossible, they even kind of portrayed her as like, is she a good person? Is she a bad person? You know, that duality, which which Catwoman always kind of has, too, as well. And she can really, I think, kind of play both sides of the field like that. So I'm um, actually, when I heard that news, I was pretty excited because I think she would be a perfect casting for that if, if that ends up being a, a, a true rumor that's out there. Well, aside from watching The Crown, I, 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 I've, I have really no idea about her. Uh, she has, I guess she hasn't really super impressed me on The Crown. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't, I honestly wasn't super in love with the crown. I, I have like a personal limit of period pieces I can do. And the sure, crown, sure. And the, well, so they're going to be getting up to, I mean, the way that looking the last season ended, they're getting close. To, I think they're almost getting to the Lady Diana days in the eighties right now. So they're, they're getting close to that point. So it'll be kind of getting more and more current, which is interesting. They're actually aging it as it goes along, but but yeah, we'll see, you know, and again, this is just a rumor, so, you know, who knows if it's true. Check out Mission Impossible. I don't, did you see Mission Impossible Fallout? I, uh, I, I refuse to watch the Mission Impossible series. Ah, uh -huh. uh, okay, well, there you go. I got a line in the sand on that one. All uh, right, all right. Well, she, well, just, you know, uh, I, I don't know, was it a Tom Cruise thing? Well, no, it's, it's really just a poorly written thing. I've, I've watched sure. two of them, and they were both just... I don't know. I like my spy thrillers to be a little less idiotic. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, was I got you. I was able to guess like all of the plot in the first two I watched, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm done. Sure. I don't need that." I understand that there's some cool ass action sequences and all that stuff, and that Tom Cruise has literally no problem risking his life and limb, and might even fight Justin Bieber. You know, uh, right, right. I truly hope that happens. I, yeah, that will be that will be that'll be that'll be, be a that'll be an event for sure. But well, yeah, I mean, and there, I'm kind of with you on that. I'm not like a huge Mission Impossible geek at all. I mean, my my jam in terms of that that world is James Bond, and that, that you know so much that I I could almost do a whole other podcast on my my James Bond obsession. I'm pretty obsessed in that world. But <laughs> um, but she, her individual, I did watch this one because this one got such a good buzz. Also having had Henry uh, Cavill in it too as well gave me a little extra incentive to uh, watch it. I wanted to see what he did outside of a Superman role too as well. And cause he got really good reviews on that. And uh, so, and then she was kind of a little bonus. I didn't realize she was even in it, but she's really, really good in it. She's a pretty central figure in it. And again, like I said earlier, she kind of plays the whole time you're watching. You're not like sure if she's like a bad person or a good person the whole time, which again, that kind of will feed right into the Catwoman thing. If, the, if that's the way they go too as well. Well, 
All right. I, I, I literally can't talk about anything else but Spider-Man now. I'm just... Okay, good, good. So that, that, that's our news, for the, our late semi-news for the week, so let's get into it. You you start. So uh, before we went on the air, before before we go, well, let's talk briefly about both of our theaters. Now, I went on opening night, and which, of course, you would think, and it was. Mine was, if it wasn't sold out, it was, there might have been a seat or two left at the most. And then, as you were telling me before we went on the air, Rex, yours was pretty much almost sold out as well. Yeah, I mean, there was... There was at best six, seven seats open in the whole theater. I, 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 I wasn't sure I was going to get to go to it. I, as you said, I, I planned on like just letting you spoil it for me and and then like try and conjecture it from, as you talk. And that was going to be fine with me for the record. I, you know, I've, I've lived this stuff and the movies are awesome. But I'm not one of those people who wigs out on spoilers too bad. It's like okay, well then you know whatever. Because it's for me, it's the execution. Uh, sure. You know. And all that, and I know every Spider-Man story kind of front and backwards, and those are the ones that count. This is just kind of the big fun movie stuff. So, but yeah, I, yeah, I want to I want to call back to our first show really quick though, as we get into this review too as well. And by the way, this is going to be, and let's say it, this is going to be a spoiler review. So if you have not, oh yeah, seen that's going to be in the yet. title. Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. But perfect. yeah, no, okay. say it out loud. If you guys don't want to hear about Spider-Man, then you probably don't want to be listening to this spoiler. Spider-Man review, because that's what's yeah, about to yeah. happen. Turn Definitely the- listen to it, but just wait until you see it, and then, yeah. then turn you know turn us back on. Pause. But, um, but I want to say for you, now that we're over the spoiler wall officially, Woo. you told me, I believe it was on our first podcast. I can't remember if it was on air or off air. You know, now we're on what, podcast? What are we on now? No, what, number five, six? No, I think this is like seven or eight. Seven or eight? Wow, here we go. Time flies when you're talking superheroes. So, uh... The uh, you were the one that predicted one of the post credit scenes, and I'm talking about the final post credit scene. You told me that you had a feeling that was going to happen, and you nailed it. And that's before I had seen Captain Marvel. Thank God I had I have seen Captain Marvel. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen Spider Man, it's almost in game. You could got got away with not seeing Captain Marvel. It, you could it will be okay because I I didn't see Captain Marvel before in game, and I was fine, but. It would do you justice to see Captain Marvel before Spider Man, if nothing else, because of the final credit scene, which we'll get into here in a minute. Yeah, uh, you know, it's just I'm not going to say it's obvious, but if you've been like paying attention to this stuff with you know obsessive eyes for you know decades, the the storylines that they they can translate to the big screen are kind of narrow in a sense, not narrow per se. I mean, there's a zillion things they could do, but like clearly, and this will, I want to get into the meta stuff towards the end of this review, but clearly Marvel has a sort of a big picture way that they look at everything. And in that regard, there's a couple of like background story structure things, like what they did with that last reveal that, you know, serve a, a multi film franchise concept pretty well. And that one's just, you know, especially with Captain Marvel introducing this particular set of characters, it's it's sort of unavoidable. You know, I mean, it had to sure. be how they did it. So, but let's yeah. uh, let's talk about the movie. What'd you think? Oh, dude, I, I really, really loved it quite a bit. Uh, I, I think the biggest standout thing, if I had to pick one thing, is just how much Tom Holland is really, really growing into the role, I mean, I could see him being Spider-Man for the next 10, you know, 12, 15 years easily. And he just seems more and more comfortable in his skin playing, playing the part. Uh, I love how much they, they're really even kind of playing up with all the fantastical stuff that happens with it, with the whole the Mysterio stuff and everything, which is great. And we'll get into the discussion of that. I love how much they are really talking about, you know, Peter Parker dealing with everyday life things, you know, worrying about his girlfriend, worrying about Aunt May, you know, did I do this? You know, all the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man things. He's, a, he's this amazing superhero. And even that they're kind of, they kind of get into him almost kind of being the new head of the Avengers, the new, the new Iron Man, uh, kind of almost handpicked by, uh, by Tony Stark. He still obviously is reluctant and, uh, is not quite ready for that responsibility uh, for that. And there's so, there's so much of that 
human element to the whole thing with even with all the special effects and again all the the illusions and everything that are happening on on the screen that's really what his personal story to me is really what um what kind of stuck with me in terms of uh once i left the theater i think uh i agree with uh, pretty much everything you said I, I i don't think that the they've yet to give him uh a, a true, complete Spider-Man, like, outing. There's still, like, some elements that need to be introduced into the series, but I like the fact that, unlike some of the other movies, they're developing, you know, they're giving him his stuff slow. They're, they're, they've they nailed, like you said, they've nailed, and Tom Holland has nailed the overwhelmed uh, teenager with superpowers thing. Like, yeah. I, I completely believe that that guy is having a lot of troubles, you know, balancing his powers and responsibi- responsibilities with going to school and all that stuff. And that is, like, the absolute core of Spider-Man. People, you know, wonder why they keep knocking him back to high school in these movies. And that's, you know, like, this is the first time, like, Tom Holland, it's like he's clearly the youngest kid to play Spider-Man. And he's also, like, you know, like... Tobey Maguire, I, I liked him in his movies, but he just kind of looked old. And, uh, like, Andrew Garfield. Andrew Garfield was what I call pretty. I don't mean that in, like, a weird way, but I'm like, you know, Peter Parker's supposed to be a little bit of a geek. Kind of, uh, right, like... Right, right. And, like, Andrew Garfield's, like, uh, I mean, again, not to sound weird, he's, like, a hunk. Like, what girls are like, I would never want to go out with Peter Parker. They're, that is not... I think the reaction the girls are having to Andrew Garfield. So, yeah, I mean, he he does the dweeby little thing. Uh, there is a moment where he, he uh, pops the shirt off and he's uh, ripped and and all that. So, clearly, he's also, you know, into the let's keep ourselves in superhero shape and everything. He's no fat Thor. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I'm just all in on Tom Holland being Spider-Man. Like you said, I actually kind of wish, uh, you know, specifically because of the end of the movie, and like you said, we'll get into that when we get towards the end of this thing, but I wish they were just making Spider-Man movies back-to-back, uh, like yeah. the Avengers. I'll take a Spider-Man movie like this every single year. You know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I agree with you, You going back into the Tom Holland thing, which uh, he is, uh, he feels real conflicted. You know, but not so much in a way like, oh, woe is me. I've got all these amazing superpowers. He still feels happy. It's not, you know, this this sucks. I don't want to be Spider-Man. But it's still just like conflicted is the best word, which is I, I think is great. And uh, the, I love the re- the realism side of things, too. Even going to the, um, uh, the first movie, um, uh, Homecoming, to where... He's still a superhero, but he still has to ride the bus, and he still has to take an airplane somewhere, and he still has to run. You know, when he, in the, in, the, in Homecoming, when he's running to the monument and he's having to try to run across the field, it's like he's not the Flash. You know, he still he does have superpowers, but he doesn't. He's not Superman. He doesn't have every superpower. There are certain things he can't do. And then in this movie, even when remember when Happy is he's. Uh, is uh, sewing him up, you know, with uh, giving him stitches, basically, and he's like complaining about how it kind of hurts, and he, he acknowledges, like, yeah, with yeah, I superpowers, but it still hurts, you know what I mean? So I thought that was good. The, it, the vulnerability, I guess, is what I'm getting to, which I think is is really great about the way that they're portraying him and the way Holland's doing it too, as well. Um, okay, so the movie it, it takes it, it starts up pretty much six seven months after the snap uh they have they've renamed thanos's snap because quite honestly there was like hardly anybody there when it happened like there was there was no reason for the public at large to call it the snap because you know like what thor was there that was it you know right Uh, right, so yeah so everybody calls it the blip and apparently you know we all saw you know, we, the survivors, theoretically, that would mean that you and I survived this thing. I got to tell right. you, though, I figure one of us would have been ghosted if we were in the thing. Yeah. Uh, the podcast would have been sad. It would have just been one of us talking. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, they deal with 
the the blip in a in a sort of a comical way. They don't touch on what a lot of people. I, I've read a lot of opinion pieces about this stuff and everything. You know, I mean, like how everybody would react if half of you know your friends disappeared, some of which in front of you in a rather kind of horrific way. You know, sure. and in the in the Avengers movie, they deal a little bit with the uh, the support group that Steve Rogers is running. But, you know, they play it a little more for comedy, which is tone appropriate for a Spider-Man movie. But so, even- and not only not only when they disappear, but also when, when they come back too, as well, when the scene when they're I think they're playing basketball and there's all of a sudden all people kind of just show up on the basketball, uh, the court as well, too. I will say also in that particular scene, also kind of weirdly appropriate that they show back up in their uniforms, the people who disappeared. You know, and they show oh, up during yeah. the game. So here's my question: Did did that game get interrupted? I mean, how do we even keep score? Do you, is there an asterisk right. on that one? You know, it's like, well, they were up at the half, but then the blip. You know, so okay. Right. So then we get uh we get to find out that Aunt May always always responsible and helpful. Aunt May is uh, working with charities to help people who were displaced and then returned by the blip. She even says. You know, when she came back, people were living in her apartment. You know, so yep. it's a it's a good bit of world building. We have to explain to everybody, you know, what the you know the status quo is moving forward. But it's a it's a tricky thing, and this this comes into comic books, and this comes in especially to these movies. You know, in the comic books, you can't ever go too far afield from the real world or you lose the attention of the readers and and the same like you know iron man invents all this incredible tech you know so why isn't all that tech revolutionizing society you know why 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 aren't we all powered on arc reactors now why don't we have flying cars like in shield you know and all this stuff you know and it becomes like a thing so when you have something like half of the entire population of the world stopped existing and then started existing again. That's that's kind of a weird thing to try and have to explain to people. So they do it. I think Spider-Man does it in a very good way. They just sort of, ah, here's some of the goofier aspects of it. Don't think about it too much. Because right. if you think about it too much, you know, you're going to go, well, you know, I mean, like, has all religion in the Marvel Universe changed? You know, sure. I mean, sure, sure. It's a yeah, but I, I thought they bit off just about you know, especially for a Spider-Man movie. Like he said, they bit off the right amount. They didn't go too too deep in it. They the one thing I thought was also cool how they explain the high. You know, that's kind of a semi-running joke throughout the movie about the uh, the high school. You know, some of the high schoolers are five years older than the other one. You know, some of them are sixteen and some of them are twenty-one. And there's even like I think there's a joke on one of the planes where I think it's MJ, but uh, somebody says something about like this guy's not old the one guy really technically was 21 but they uh, said that he's not old enough to drink you know because he, he wasn't part of the blip or whatever so that that was that was kind of interesting you know yeah good old flash thompson's being a douchebag and mj has to kind of call him out and get his drink, right right that's get what his it was, drink yeah. confiscated and you know that's a you know the mj and flash thing it's a good thing you brought that up because that kind of brings it to the next point i wanted to bring up like spider-man's flat out uh a superhero teen comedy like you have all of the teen comedy tropes. You've got like, you know, uh, you've got a romantic rival for uh, a relationship that one character is fixated on. You got a, you got a wacky friend. You got weird situation based misunderstandings where like Peter's trying to hide that he's Spider Man from MJ and he's kind of double talking. And you've got like, you've got the jock character, which is like the the rival for MJ with Peter with Brad. You've got like the the bully character with Flash Thompson, and then you've got the clueless adults, which are the teachers, and then you got the kids who talk way smarter than kids are supposed to talk. Right, right, yeah. You know? yeah it definitely has uh, Homecoming even more, but still in this movie too as well. It definitely has some very intense John Hughes elements to it as well. And I think the thing that was, that was really good about uh, especially Homecoming and even this one too as well, although I do feel that they're kind of on the cusp of it right now in this one, uh, is that you really believe those kids would be in high school, you know? Um, but I think this is the last, I think the next one, they definitely got to be graduated because they're right on that edge. Uh, like, you know, of the, you know, even Tom Holland and of course, Sunday too, as well, where they're looking more like, 
people in their 20s versus uh, high school kids now, too, as well. But I think, still think they pulled it off on this one, especially with the blip being, being incorporated in everything as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. They stuck Tobey Maguire in the high school movie. If they can get away uh, with yeah, that, they can get true, away with point. anything. Just hand wave it like, just shut up. They're in high school. Leave us alone. You know, right? But they didn't leave him in high school very. Like, I think in the first, the, the Sam Raimi. I don't think he was in. I mean, they got him out. You remember they were. They know, graduated at the end of the movie. First... Yeah, he's out at the end of the movie. Right, right, right. Yeah, so he's uh, living, you know, living in the apartment. But yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, though, Tobey Maguire also looked like he was getting ready to retire at the same right, time. He was right, way right. too That's old for point. that thing. But then, I like, again, another thing I just love was just the near constant comedy. The scene with uh, Fury tranking Ned and then everybody coming and knocking on the door to check on him and Fury getting more and more annoyed. That, I like, that was actual comedy gold. That was good. That was great, yeah, exactly, and him kind of having the gun cocked just in case the door got open, and and the obviously the uh, the the teacher, you know, I can't think of the gentleman's name, the one that he was in the first one too as well. That's kind of like their um, the the one that brought them on the trip. Basically, he ends up being a, a good uh, comedy. Uh, Are you piece talking about the guy with the beard or the bald yes, guy? Yes, that guy, that guy. I remember because yeah, I can't he remember what his, his name's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, and he was in the first one. He was the one that you know obviously ran there when they had the uh, the competition thing that they had to go to the yeah, to yeah. Washington D.C. in the first one. Um, but he ends up you know being an essential. I like the fact that all those characters you and I are talking about right now, they're making them part of Spider-Man's little universe. You know, Ned and and of course MJ and and every, everybody that's like all the same characters they brought back from the from the first one. Like those those characters you remember and even bring in the one uh uh girl the one that's like that does the news cat like the the, the news cats on the high school news how she ends up becoming obviously a pretty central uh character in this one too as well uh so you're actually seeing those other you know side characters kind of grow and scope within the movie as well i think that was very very well done you know what you're calling what you're, what we're talking about here is spider-man's supporting cast spider-man has had since day one one of the richest supporting casts uh, of of comics. You know, uh, this was, uh, again, one of Stan Lee's masterpiece moves was world building. He just did such yeah. a great job with, uh, you know, like they did, a, the comic book creators, especially Marvel, they, they, they pioneered something called the Marvel Method. And that the idea was that, like, Stan Lee would come up with a plot and he would give the plot to the artist. The artist would read the plot figure out how to represent that in a graphic medium, and then Stan Lee would take the drawings back and then letter them, sort of dialogue. You know, he would write a plot, get back the films, so to speak, and then write what everybody was saying to each other. And uh, But Stan Lee was known for giving occasionally some copious notes, and he, you know, he worked really hard on creating that cast. Like, it's Ned Leeds, who is a reimagined uh, older character, and Betty Brant was actually originally uh, a secretary at the Daily Bugle. Uh, we we managed to get back the most important Spider-Man non-like uh, villain supporting character, although he's kind of a villain later in the movie, and we'll mention that for sure. But, uh, you know, he's got just a rock-solid set of characters, and they, they'd be fools to not use these, and that's actually kind of what they did wrong. They focused on Harry Osborn and all that stuff, but, man, like... Spider-Man's got really cool friends, and, and stories come from them all the time. And another thing Spider-Man has, and this is what I really want to get into here, is the absolute best rogues gallery of villains. And we get not just Mysterio, but we get sort of representations of four other ones in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mysterio, I mean, we'll, we'll get into the other four in a minute. But, uh, wow, Jake Gyllenhaal him too as well i mean now we've got keaton in the first one and jillian hall in the second one i mean they're, they're sparing no expense in terms of their villains and these which is which are remarkable that used to be always kind of the knock on marvel i know in the movie universe and in the comics but definitely in the movie universe is how you know whenever you everybody got into the dc versus marvel talk everybody was like oh well dc's always got way better villains than marvel have and close. uh and they are disproving that with 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 this franchise for sure and Hall is just so so good in this uh so much so i mean 
I, I, I've read enough of the comics to know much of, enough about Mysterio's background to know that he is a villain. But there was a good, you know, 20 minutes into this movie. I'm like, wow, maybe they're going to do a whole different interpretation of him. Maybe he's not going to be like, you know, the, the bad guy, you know, like they were really, I was kind of starting to kind of follow them along on that. Even that I knew in the back of my head, I know something's going to change here, but Gyllenhaal. So was so convincing in terms of the way that he was pulling off the whole, I'm a superhero or, or a future Avenger myself type thing. And of course the whole, you know, replacing Tony Stark and, and, uh, and Peter Parker's life to, uh, plot that they had going on too is this genius as well. Um, but yeah, so you, you give me your thoughts on that, uh, Rex. I'm sure you have meant plenty. Well, first of all, flat out, since I was like six years old, I have loved Mysterio. Um, when I was a little, how do you think? We're, we're not we're not to interrupt you, but what? You, I mean, you were you happy with the costume and everything? Because it was oh, like, that's it what was that's so exactly dark. where I was going. Like yeah, that yeah, was yeah. the thing that drew me to Mysterio. Was like literally, like. I was given this little digest of the of the first Spider-Man issues, and I'm flipping through them, and I'm like, "Who's the dude with the fishbowl on his head?" And it's like, right, right. you know, I, I, I'm an artist uh, myself, nowhere near some of these classics. But Steve Ditko is the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Stan Lee would give the plots, and and then so you know, Stan Lee probably said something to Steve Ditko like, "I don't know, uh, this villain's of uh, you know a con man." So, I don't know, come up with something. And, like, Steve Ditko's like, okay, giant cape, fishball on his head, little eyeball grommets, giant gauntlets for no reason, and everything's purple and green. And it's like, oh, okay, you know? <laughs> right. What, what was that all about? And for the record, Steve Ditko, absolutionist, uh, complete objectivist, non-drug user. Everybody's always said, oh, Steve Ditko was all high and shit. Steve Ditko was as straight as an arrow, son. And he drew and he created Doctor Strange's visuals and all of Mysterio. I mean, Mysterio is everything you want, and they killed it in the movie. He is the absolute most movie. I mean, like in the comics, he's an ex movie special effects guy. Like, you right, can't right. have a character more ready for being in a movie than Mysterio. And. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I even I posted about seeing the movie as a sort of a surprise on the way home uh, from the theater last night, and I mentioned that Mysterio is a villain, and I, I got a private message from somebody, and they were like upset because they were like they weren't sure from the trailer if he was going to be the villain or not. And I'm like, man, Mysterio's been a villain since 1964. I am not right, giving 55 right. year old uh, spoiler warnings to people, you know. I mean, it's just that's a little bit. Well, ludicrous. that again, the genius, but that, that's that I think that's the genius of Marvel too. Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe too is just because uh, you know we we all know that Marvel will kind of change things up a little bit. That even as they did with Mysterio, having him tied to Tony Stark and Stark Industries, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. But the uh, just how the, convincingly they were almost like, you know. You almost thought that, you know, I almost went through a little thing. I wonder if they're going to, you know, talking about the, the alternate universe, if they're going to kind of explain away his villain, villainy, like in terms of the comics and um, the way that they all it all came together, which we'll discuss here is was just genius, too, as well. Yeah, I think the uh, the Tony Stark thing was both uh, a matter of inspiration and uh, just sort of contrivance in a way, because, you know. Quick, quick question, comic book Wikipedia man. Do did have Mysterio and Iron Man ever met in the comics? I'm sure they have. It's not anything, yeah. not anything big. They occasionally do like a sort of a switch off kind of thing. Like you know, occasionally sure. the Joker will go fight Superman or whatever. But right. um, you know, his most famous other interaction with uh, another hero is a particularly uh, gruesome story he had with Daredevil. Um, oh wow! Well, that makes sense because obviously, with Kingpin, obviously went over to Spider Man's universe quite a bit too, as well. So yeah, it's you know, it's that's Both New York guys, so that makes sense. Yeah, okay. the story, and it also the story just takes way too long to even con contemplate explaining. But yeah, you don't need to. That's not anything anybody needs to. Know. Yeah, you know, Mysterio though. Generally, you know, he's a Spider Man. The thing is, a lot of the uh, the editors and the creators and stuff and the comics. There's certain villains they get a little territorial with, like sure, you know, and 
again, Mysterio is a great visual, but you know, once you lose the fact that anybody, I mean, you know, like they use Mysterio's best trick in his first appearance in 1964, you know, he pretends to be Spider-Man and then he pretends to be a hero to catch Spider-Man. And because gotcha. he, he frames him for a crime and then tries to pretend he's going to help catch him. And like, it, once you know that Mysterio is the master of illusions, so to speak, or whatever, then you stop giving any credence to any crazy shit that goes on when Mysterio's around. It's right, like, you right. know, they do a, you know, there's a, a fight sequence in this movie though that is pure gold for both Mysterio, Spider Man, bringing the, the comics to life and everything. The the sequence where Peter has started to suss out that, you know, the elementals aren't quite so really elemental and he goes to warn fury about it we get a whole sequence of mysterio at his finest you know with layer upon la i mean the, that sequence is just an amazingly shot you're talking about the uh the one with the subway scene with all the, like the more psychedelic co colors and all that kind of stuff yeah oh like yeah and it just keeps uh was well, subway well Wait, isn't uh when, doesn't he actually get hit by a train okay yeah but and, that's not a, yeah, yeah that's above ground so it's just a train um, right right just train excuse me sorry. yeah 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 no no it's just me getting confused yeah no that whole thing where you know you, you, at one point there's an army of spider-man who who dogpile on him that's straight from the comics. right right that was great that was the, that was such a good shot yeah they constantly change the uniforms throughout the uh the sequence he, he does he does such a brilliant job of keeping peter parker off balance with his illusions uh you know we we should just you know, for folks who, were, since we're spoiling this, Mysterio is using a series of drones and a bunch of helpers to fake these giant elemental creatures attacking. And the elemental creatures are vaguely based on traditional Spider-Man villains who, you know, they're, they're fun villains. There's the Molten Man and the Cyclone and all that. But they're sort of amped into monsters, kind of, and just sort of made to throw away characters. And, you know, honestly, it's... I don't think they'd ever use Cyclone in a Spider-Man movie, so you know we got we got to sort of see him. So yay, you know. Sure. That was fun. Well, but... the other and also I thought it was great. You're talking about uh, Mysterio's helpers and true Marvel uh, universe uh, fashion, uh, Kevin Feige fashion. He uh, a lot of the helpers were from past Marvel movies, going all the way back to the very first Iron Man movie too, which I thought was like wow. You're, you're, I mean, the first, yeah, the one guy that was actually the kind of master, the one that was kind of running the computer, I can't think what that gentleman's name was, um, but you remember how they showed how he was there with uh, Jeff Bridges from the very first uh, Iron Man movie, which I thought was great. You know, I did not catch that, so good Oh, eye. yeah, yeah, that was, he was, he was the one, uh, you know, with, uh, I can't remember Jeff Bridges' character's name in the first Spider-Man movie, I mean, Obadiah me, Iron Man movie. Stain. Right, right. Well, he was uh, the one guy. He was they. They did that little flashback scene where he was actually one of his helpers in that movie too, as well. And so Jake Gyllenhaal, or I.E. Mysterio, I guess uh, recruited him through uh, through their connections there with uh, Stark Industries. Which that's I thought was a, genius. That's a good catch. I did not uh, catch that in the. I, I was probably just uh, wrapped up in taking my notes. I, I, right, I'll have right. to see this movie two or three more. Uh, you know that's facetious i know i'll see this movie two or three hundred more times so right. I, I wasn't too again i was ready to let you spoil it for me so i didn't really mind sitting there and taking notes because i love this thing but yeah that whole that whole fight sequence when he goes to warn uh spider-man or he goes to warn nick fury spider-man goes to warn nick fury and they they cut and mysterio hits him with just a barrage of like credible scenario illusions that are buried on top of illusions that are buried on top of illusions to put them off guard and it's it's a it's literally classic mysterio in you know from the comics and how you would do things you know and i was just very impressed by that whole sequence right and, and i'm also was just so impressed myself about how while all that just chaos is going on with with him on on his superhero side of things, you still have this kind of budding love story that's happening between him and MJ, and they do it in a really 
really good high school. It didn't feel like an adult version of like what a love story would be. It felt more like high schooly, um, which added to more to the character too as well. But but they kept that theme kind of going throughout the entire movie. I mean, they kept kind of going back to that. So, you know, you could, uh, half the movie is almost kind of like a love story, you know, as much as it is, you know, I mean, there's so many movies within movies with, you know, within this one. We've got the whole MJ, Peter Parker love story. You've got the whole, you know, semi-father figure thing happening with, um, you know, Tony Stark and, and, uh, and uh, him kind of taking over the responsibility of possibly being the, the new head of the Avengers, yeah, you know, there's just so many subplots going on too, as well. Of course, everything going on with uh, uh, with uh, Mysterio too, as well, which is which was the main focal point on most of it. But yeah, there's just so many layers and depths. And you talk about the watchability. That's the one thing I will say about Homecoming, which I thought that's one of all the Marvel movies. Um, like even Infinity War, I loved Infinity War. And I've seen Infinity War quite a few times now, but. Homecoming is one that I can literally put on at any time, any time in the day, almost like a Shawshank Redemption kind of vibe where it's like, I'll just put it on and kind of have it on the background and kind of watch it. And this movie, the Spider-Man movie too, Far From Home has that same, just after seeing it one time, it's like, I want to watch it again. You know, part of it's for the action, part of it's for the love story, part of it is just for the character building. It's kind of got that same kind of quality. Uh, it's like I said, that it's literally a superhero teen romantic comedy. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. it's like they, I, I like genre mashup stuff. And, uh, I think, you know, like Ant-Man is a heist movie with superheroes, you know, the first, yeah. the first Ant-Man and like, you know, th as they start embracing these, uh, sort of genre blending things, I, th I mean, you know, they're going to end up making stuff like horror movies that are also superhero movies and stuff like that. Sure. I mean, so, well, well, that's already happening in the DC universe. We talked about that on our last show with the, uh, with the Aquaman thing too, as well with the trench. Yeah. Well, we'll again, same thing with the flash. Let's, let's wait till like something happens before we even consider that being real, but sure. Sure. Know, sure. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a goof off. I mean, and they, you know, they embrace, before I go in, I want to talk a little bit about some of the humor in the movie. But one thing I, I want to say, this was something I was saying when they, when I, what I meant earlier when I said they haven't given him a complete Spider-Man like story yet. This is a kind of a weird little personal thing, but Spider-Man, this is very important, is supposed to be funny. Like literally, the guy Peter Parker, when he puts on the mask, it's supposed to be an element of freedom, and he becomes. Uh, sort of a Bugs Bunny esque mocking people thing. They did it okay in like say that those Andrew Garfield movies. They gave him some some decent lines and, and stuff. But he's supposed to be using his humor to put people off. And what I think they're doing, and I, I think they're doing it on purpose because Marvel doesn't seem to make any mistakes, is they're building that up. I, what I think we're really seeing is a very long protracted build up to what will be a, a, just a very public Spider-Man fight somewhere down the line where he has to fight a lot of stuff and just has to start making fun of them to confuse. I mean, that's what he does. He makes fun of people until they get upset. He trolls them. Spider-Man is right. literally a superhero troll. He'll just be, you know, talking about your, your, you know, your weight and shit like that in the middle of a fight right. just to keep you off your, your, your guard. I really want that. But, you know, if you can't have a Spider-Man that jokes, make a freaking funny Spider-Man movie. And they did. I mean, it's I, I laughed. The nice hooligans, and when he wakes up after getting hit by the train in the Netherlands, you know, and how nice everybody was to him. But, I mean, like, all those hooligans in that jail cell with him, they're clearly in that jail cell for a reason. You know, one sure, would assume they sure. got super hammered, uh, as hooligans are wont to do, and caused some trouble. But they're nice as can be sober in the morning. They've, they've thrown a jersey over sleeping Peter, and they're concerned about their jailer's pregnant wife. Uh, I thought that was some great, just sort of toothless but still funny. I mean, it wasn't mean in any way. The, those jokes right. weren't to anybody's expense. It's just some silliness. That's supposed to be Spider-Man. Silly shit yeah. happens. Exactly, yeah. I agree with that. I forgot about that scene, but yeah, that was, that was a great scene too as well. Now, to me though... Uh, for closing action sequences to a Spider-Man movie, you know, 
to me, up till now, the gold standard has been Spider-Man 2 with Alfred Molina playing Doc Ock, that whole, uh, that whole sequence. But I think this was the, the best Spider-Man action sequence. The ending of this movie, the, the, the very just insanely imaginative uses of Spider-Man's powers. That's the best when he fights the drones with the webbing. That's the best use of Spider-Man's webbing in a movie yet. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point too as well. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, that ending sequence was was incredible and I thought also with uh going to Mysterio and Jake Gyllenhaal, the way that they kind of kept going between the reality of him and the illusion back and forth and it almost became the 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 reality became almost more as much of a threat as the illusion did the way they were able to do that. I thought that was just so, so good as you know, and obviously bringing, bringing all the kids, all his friends, MJ and all the friends uh, with happy being part of that too, as well. Uh, which is another point we haven't talked too much about in the movie is John Favreau's, uh, how much of a factor he was in this movie. He was almost kind of a foil in the first one in a way, because Tony Stark was more the, um, the focal point whenever they brought them into play, but how he, uh, he kind of bridged kind of the Avengers world into the Spider-Man world. And he was, uh, I mean, I just think he was, he was such a, a crucial character in this movie too, as well. And such and funny, my, my favorite line, which was also in the, in the, in the preview too, as well, is when he's going to rescue the kids and there, and he, he said, I'm here to, you know, I'm helping you here to help you for, you know, with Spider-Man and, and the one guy's, he's like, you work for Spider-Man. No, I work with Spider-Man. You know, very, very crucial point for him to say that I don't, I'm not working for Spider-Man. I work with Spider-Man. I thought that was really funny. And even though I saw that in the, that was a big thing in the trailer too, that still hit home actually in the movie when you saw it happen live. Uh, you know, I, I liked him. I, I like Favreau in this. Um, I like the, uh, the giving in the series of mentors after we, uh, after we wrap this up, I, I want to delve into a couple of the things like the themes of the movies. Cause you know, they, they nail a lot of the classic Spider-Man themes in this, and Favreau is a part of that. Um, the uh, I, I felt like occasionally he was maybe a hair distracting even from huh. the overall thing. I don't know. It's like uh, all the Favreau scenes seem to be weighted more, minus the, uh, the one on the plane where the, he's like helping him get back into him seem weighted more by Favreau's character than anything having to do with Spider-Man. It was like, you know, it was Spider-Man. Oh, and, best, and best, probably one of the funniest laugh out lines in the theaters too. Uh, I love Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, you when know, they playing, when they were playing back in black by ACDC. Yeah. The, uh, the touches on Holland's, uh, social media unawareness is, uh, really good. And actually that brings me to, to my mind, the only real flaw with the movie is like the brutal MacGuffin that they introduce in the movie. Uh, the MacGuffin, I don't know if you know this, is a term uh, coined by uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, it's basically any story device that serves no purpose basically other than to be a story device. And uh, the Greeks called it the Deus Ex Machina, which would be like the sort of weird machine that would descend from uh, the sky in their plays that would be sort of like Zeus and everybody coming in to fix everything. And that's the glasses that Peter inherits from uh, Tony uh, Stark, the the AI-empowered glasses that he's used in the other movies uh, called Edith. I, I felt like that was my one weak spot. It was like, it was another case of something happening and all of the troubles stopping at once. Like, you know, in the Avengers movie, they stop the MacGuffin of the, you know, the portal and they blew up the thing. All the, all the enemies drop dead on the spot. You know, there's a lot of these, you know, it's the HG Wells thing from war of the worlds, all the aliens, you know, all the Martians died because of the, of the common cold thing there. Sure. I, don't, I don't so much like, movies that use like a off switch for all of the villains, you know, and, that, it, yeah. and it makes kind of sense in the fact that it was a technological based threat and you can kind of just turn that off. But they, they introduced this thing that, 
you know, had never really been made a thing before. They turned it into a serious back and forth thing once Mysterio cons Peter out of the glasses and everything. There is a good comedy bit where Peter almost kills one of his classmates, you know, which again is just hilarious plus deadly, you know, but sure, sure. Y- you know, I just, that was my only, only real knock on the entire film was that it was like, that was a little bit brutal and convenient. Well, yeah, it was, but, uh, you know, I, it, they were used, I thought very well in that scene where he gives the glasses over to Mysterio. That was a pretty crucial part of the movie, obviously. And, um, I mean, I guess they could have used another way for him to pass the, uh, the Tony Stark powers back and forth or whatever, or, or the control that Tony Stark had. But I, I think that was kind of, I mean, they had to use something, some kind of thing for him to pass that, pass that torch over to him. And, and, you know, with using Edith where he gave, gives him the, gives um, Mysterio the glasses was uh, the way to do it that you could do in a relatively short period of time. And it would make sense to the movie watcher. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand the structural significance and the importance uh, of it, the necessity even. But it's just, I don't know, uh, the whole do one thing and all the villains stop thing. You know, like Independence Day, you blow up the mothership, every single other ship stops. It's like, you know. Right, I got you. I, I, mean, I got you. I see where you're coming from. I know, yeah. I know you got to tie this all up. Um, you know, speaking of tying things up, we should start heading towards you know, there's a couple of themes besides that I wanted to touch on. I mean, we talked about loss uh, for a second. You know, Spider-Man's predicated on loss. You know, he screwed up and let his uncle die, which is I, I find really interesting that we've gone two entire Spider-Man movies without mentioning the actual. I mean, y- you had that sort of sad exchange in Peter's room in Captain America's Civil War, but we've yet to like. You know, we all know because we've seen the 18 other times Uncle Ben has died on screen. But, you know, I, I like how they're keeping that away from everything. And they're just making, you know, now he feels super responsible and sad that, you know, Tony Stark is other men or his dad. Peter Parker cannot keep a father figure. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it is interesting that they haven't, you know, with the exception of, you know, right in Civil War, when he's talking about not bringing up to Aunt May about about Uncle Ben, um, they haven't really talked about that at all. But I, I think that's good, you know, it's nice, uh, you know, not to jump over to DC World real quick, but uh, it makes me wonder, like, if in the uh, Matt Reeves bat- Batman, if we're going to see the, uh, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne's parents get killed again, which we've seen countless times, too, as well, depending on how backstory they go that. So I think it's kind of almost refreshing here in the Spider-Man world that we aren't, you know, beating the the watcher at least at this point over the head with the origin story too much. I mean, we haven't seen Peter this, this we haven't seen this Peter Parker get bit by the spider either yet either as well. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a really good move. I, I do say though, and this is uh one of the uh, you know, just to finish my point on on the the lost thing real quick. I mean, they they really do a, a wonderful job throughout the movie of talking about how the world's lost Iron Man. The world's wondering what they're going to do next. You know, is Spider-Man going to step up? That just speaks to his his love of responsibility. And that's uh, another topic uh, to, to touch on. But they do just such a... Mysterio does such a wonderfully evil thing when he brings back Tony's corpse for a second in that illusion. That is, Mysterio is such a dick. <laughs> I mean, right, he's just right, a right. real... Nasty, and... Uh, my and last... That was done. By the way, that that I forgot about that 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 Iron Man, like I'm a zombie Iron Man that they had. What a visually that was done so well. It wasn't done, you know, they, they, a couple different pin strokes or you know moves on the computer that could have been uh, come off as super super cheese ball, and and they they did it. I think in a in a pretty original and and uh, and powerful way too. Yeah, I just you know. One thing I really liked, just a last note on Mysterio, is team. They showed him having a team in this. In the comics, they always hand wave it away that Mysterio uses robots and everything. I, this is one of my main problems with villains like Mysterio and stuff. Like, couldn't you sell that technology? Like, you know, wouldn't wouldn't you just be a better businessman? Like this this comes into like Peter Parker. Like, shouldn't you find a way to sell the formula for your webbing? You know, wouldn't that be a really good crowd control thing for the police to use 
to just be able sure. to spray that webbing all over the top of rioters and stuff like I mean like Right, right. You know, there's right, good point. like shouldn't Bruce Wayne just fix Gotham with his money? You know, I mean, which is better? Yeah. Beating up criminals or funding like a, you know, re education and like training facilities, dude. You know, sure, like sure. give people jobs. Um but, well, let's, uh, let's head on to uh we've covered a lot of the points of the movie, so let's let's kind of start heading into mid credit and post credit world a little bit. What do you well, think? Yeah, that's that's definitely uh the building of the future. Uh, they they do a really good job. They Nick Fury, uh, who we uh, find out isn't all Nick Furious. Uh, let's let's do these in orders. What do you think of the first credit scene? It was cool. Well, the one thing I thought was really clever, which um, if they've done this in other movies, I don't remember, but I thought it was kind of neat. Where they almost the mid credit scene was almost a continuation of the end of the actual movie itself, with uh, you know with MJ and him flying through the city. It was almost kind of like, oh, we just kind of stopped that scene and we continued that scene on, which which I thought was neat as opposed to trying to make it in a whole new setting. Um, but, of course, everybody freaked out in the theater, you know, myself included, when J. Jonah Jameson comes on screen and, you know, you still have the, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name J.K. Right Simmons. Now? Yeah, J.K. Simmons. I should I should know better than that. Um, yeah, having him play the, play the, I mean, that was, that just shows you how much Kevin Feige, how how confident he is in his and what they've created in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that they can go and why recast? I mean, he's such perfect casting. You know, it's like why go and recast him with someone else? That was and the, that way that just you know mentally bridges everything between that and the Sam Raimi Spider Man. It was just such a genius move. And it was so good to see him on there. And I'm hoping that, you know, that wasn't just a cameo. Hopefully he will actually be a character in the next Spider-Man moving forward, too. Uh, recasting him a la his current role in the comics where he is kind of uh, Alex Jones, in a, in a sense, in the comics now. You know, print media sure. is dead, so running the newspaper is kind of useless, you know, as, right. a, as a story convention. So, yeah, uh, and having him, you know, Mysterio's kind of, last F you and for the record I need to say this there is literally no way that Mysterio is dead there's just literally no way oh I, I don't I don't think that for a second yeah the, well. and then the other thing that the neat you know they there's so many parallels between Spider-Man and, and Iron Man and obviously the big parallel with uh Iron Man and the very first Iron Man movie telling the world that he is Iron Man which is not really obviously Peter Parker, i.e. Spider-Man style, but they almost kind of did it for him with, with him telling everybody that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So that's kind of a, a cool, very cool twist, too. Again, you know, Mysterio filming that thing when he's like, you know, uh, either, you know, my thought is that Mysterio filmed that afterwards. Like he used footage and like he's sitting in his Mysterio lair somewhere in Europe right now. And like he's like, you know what, F Spider Man. And again, Mysterio's a dick. <laughs> he's just right. He is like the the best petty villain. And that revealing Spider Man's identity to the world is something they've done in the comics uh, more than once. Uh, it changes. You know, I mean, we ended the first movie with Aunt May finding out he's Spider Man. We end <laughs> the second movie with everybody finding out he's Spider Man. You know, it it really. Uh, upends the dynamics but again also the next the next after credit scene kind of uh illustrates why some of this won't help but you know there are all those drones there's all those people who worked for mysterio who are out there although likely now they're all reunited with mysterio because like they all were clearly you know helping him fake his death or had to have been so who knows how that's all going to work out, but it's a wonderful story device, you know. Uh, yeah. I really hope that the next Spider-Man movie literally starts with him still standing on the top of that streetlight with everybody looking at him, you know. And he has right, like, that'd be good. That'd be a really good way to do it. It'd be super clever, and, and you know, Marvel's Marvel's the company to do that. I could see them doing that right away too, as well. And what do you think about the um, the post? You know, that was mid credit, obviously. What about uh, post credit? Which again, for our listeners. Uh, you know, send uh, send Rex a bottle of champagne or something like that because he and I can tell you this firsthand. I can't remember if we were on air or off air when he told me this. Probably off air because I try and be cool about that shit. Yeah, he predicted this to the T that the scrolls were going to be in this Spider Man as one of the one of the post credit scenes. Because remember, I was saying I thought it would be 
something to do with Green Goblin. And you're like, no, I think it's going to be uh, the, the scrolls. And uh, you nailed it. Well, first of all, the scrolls are liars. And Mysterio is a liar. And Nick Fury is a liar. He's a spy. You know, I mean, they, they deal with truth throughout this movie as a theme. You know, MJ has her little speech about truth. You know, there's multiple times where telling the truth and the, and at the end of the movie, the truth about his identity, identity comes out. Like, you know, they hammer that home. And the other thing is very early in the Spider-Man, uh, original comics, they had some green, very scroll like supposed aliens in the story. They've, they've since linked those people up with Mysterio. It's, it, it's been a very weird little element of it, but you know, Marvel interconnects everything. Nick Fury has dealt with the Skrulls. You know, uh, the Skrulls are... Uh, I, we've been introduced to some... I mean, once again, we see our good-natured Skrull friends, Talos and his wife. But, you know, in the end, the Skrulls are villains. So don't... Uh, whereas Talos and his wife and that little sect of them might end up still being good folks. Like, Talos, when masquerading as Nick Fury earlier in the movie... You know, uh, he has a little throwaway when they're walking and they think everything else is done and he's talking to Hill and he's like, you know, don't the Kree have a sleeper cell somewhere here on Earth feeding them information? You know, and that they never mm -hmm. reference that again. It's just a walking line. And that was like a huge, to me, that was like a giant flashing red light. Like, this is important. Pay attention to right, this. Right. You know, because that shit's going to yeah. come. In the comics, there's a very famous... We're talking about the future here and what those scenes mean. The Spider-Man being revealed scene shows that Spider-Man's going to have... You know, he's had a kind of a charm life in the first two movies. There's been, like, setbacks and stuff, and clearly whatever, you know, with you know him losing all his father figures and everything. But in the, in the comics, being Spider-Man sucks. Like, it's... You never get to do anything you want to do because there's always somebody robbing a bank wearing a you know super costume and some shit you gotta go deal with you know your right. aunt's always falling down sick you know uh and i really think that that's going to be the theme of the next spider-man movie but i think the theme of like the next generation of of star of of these movies is going to be the the scrolls the kree some space shit that's going to be brought on by the eternals i think it's just all world building and i was super happy to see it what about you yeah, me too. I mean, I, I love how they're connecting these two and, and, and how, you know, again, that uh, Marvel almost forces you to, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, I was super happy that I happened to see, finally saw Captain Marvel because, the, you know, that scene wouldn't have had uh, nearly the impact, but might not even made sense to me had I not seen Captain Marvel. And so it kind of get, reinforces like, yes, you have to see all these Marvel movies, you know, no matter what, whatever your opinion is of them or whatever kind of buzz you hear about them too as well. So, uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was great. It was, um, it threw me. I, d I was not expecting it at all. Um, you know, I thought they were, for a second, I almost thought they were going to kind of go into like a little Pulp Fiction kind of playback when they had the two of them in the car type thing, you know, uh, with, with uh, Samuel, ja Samuel Jackson in the car. But uh, it was it was genius. It was great. I, uh, I I gotta tell you again. I just can't. I I, I can't wait. Uh, we got to figure that like they've been saying for you know Feige has been saying for a long time that he was gonna bust out the news for uh, what what's happening next once Spider Man premiered. You know Spider Man. I mean it's still. I mean we're recording this on the Fourth of July, and uh, we're gonna have this out tomorrow. But I mean most movies would premiere tomorrow. Spider Man for the record. Uh, in America, I think it made thirty point one million dollars on Tuesday. It's the biggest Tuesday movie opening of all times. Um, wow! I think it's ridiculous that we're opening movies on Tuesdays now, but you know whatever. Uh, I mean, I'm happy because I got to go see it. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it's like sure. the, the movie cycle never ended. They, they've said that so far we've had sort of a weak movie market for the summer. And there have been, like, a lot of eyes on whether Marvel was going to bring it again. Marvel nails it with this movie. I, I You know, I think uh, I trust them more than I've ever considered trusting any entertainment entity up till yeah. this point in my life. 
Marvel, yeah, do even whatever more you than want. Star Wars, and yeah, all that. I agree. It's it's so it's pretty incredible, and they keep getting better. It's not. It doesn't feel like it's kind of. There's not a rehash like we talked about. I think a couple podcasts ago, where that little 2011 through 2013 little period, of, like when the, the Iron Man sequels were happening and all, and the Avengers sequel were happening. It was kind of go like, oh, this is getting like you like your your terminology. It was getting a little samey samey there for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden, Guardians of the Galaxy busts on the scene, and that kind of changes the whole ball game altogether. And uh, it's uh, it's pretty amazing, and and the way that you know even that Spider Man is connected to all the other universes, he lives. I mean, this this this, this franchise is becoming it living its own its own thing too as well. So. Um, I don't know, but you know, this is kind of our first kind of official movie review on the show, and we haven't really we didn't talk about this before we went on air. But uh, what would you, if we were to give a uh, let's kind of let's wrap this up with, if you were to give this a, uh, you know, what do we? I don't know, would you go, you know, one through ten, or we go A through A through F? Let's like go what, one through ten. Maybe, I've always hated the A through F system. Okay, cool. Well, let's go one through ten. Now, like, what would you give this uh, give this movie? I uh, give it a solid to, uh, nine. Um. You know, the whole thing, uh, it told a single cohesive story as well as touched on a bunch of different kind of semi-important themes. And it it did it uh, throughout the whole thing in a fairly original and uh, entertaining way. Yep, yep. I'll say I'm almost at a nine. I'll say I'm going to say I'll say an 8.5 right now. I still... My initial gut is I still think I like Homecoming just a little bit more. Um, and I think a big part, nothing to do with anybody in the current movie at all, but just I thought Michael Keaton was just so incredible. And still that, that big reveal was such a good one with him being the, the father in there too as well. That was such a shocker. Even that I, when I see it now, when I even know what's going to happen, when, when he finds out that... Uh, Michael, you know, his, his girlfriend's father is, is the enemy that he has to fight. I still think that was just so genius in the way they did that in the first movie, too, as well. So, um, but, you know, again, this is on first showing, still very fresh, but I just loved it so much. I, I, I would recommend it to anyone. I think it's a must-see. And, and if we haven't uh, said it enough here on this, this podcast, make sure you stay till the very end, too, as well. The post credit you know, there's the mid-credit scene, which happens a good maybe two or three minutes after the credits start running. But the uh, the final credit, you know, in my theater at least, the lights were up. There were some people leaving, which I still can't believe if you've seen a Marvel movie why you would leave. But it's like almost you think it's, uh, you know, it's the very end. And, and it's such a strong, both both the mid and the post credit scenes are not your, you know, Marvel sometimes they'll do the little funny thing at the end, you know, with like the Captain America thing they did at the end of the first Spider-Man uh, movie. Worst um, after this- credit scene Marvel's done. Worst. Yes, it's inc- yeah. There's a hands down for sure. Yes, definitely. They they could have both been in the actual movie itself. They were so strong. So definitely. So yeah, I loved it, and I and I'm and I'm looking uh, looking forward to seeing what happens with uh, Tom Holland and and the Spider Man universe moving forward. You know, uh, just as a last thought, this just occurred to me. I, I wonder almost if Marvel movies are so powerful that they're causing uh, movie theaters to change how they train their employees. Because it's like, you know, when those credit scenes come on and the lights come on, I hate, like, you're trying to sit there and watch this last thing. They've got the lights on, and the people are at the end of the aisle with the brooms coming in to sweep up all the popcorn and everything. It's like, could you, right. could you let us finish the goddamn movie before right, you scare right, us and make right. us feel bad? And I've started to notice theaters, like, telling everybody to hang back. And it's like, because I've left, you know... After the credit, and you see them all just standing there outside the doors, and it, is it over finally? It's like, yeah, calm down. But yeah, well, I'm uh, surprised they actually, they actually, you know, in the, the mid credit scene in my theater, they still had the lights down. But then after, as soon as that ran, then they they started bringing the lights up. I'm surprised that you know Marvel itself doesn't instruct, or maybe that's just some kind of psychology behind it. Who knows? Uh, in terms of marketing, but they they <laughs> still brought the the house lights all the way up for that. You know, we were watching the post credit scene with the house lights on. You know, ridiculous. Okay, yep. so we both agree. Freaking Marvel is awesome. Uh, Spider Man was fantastic. Please go see it. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, if you see Freak Base coming to your town, you know, check your concert calendars. Uh, Freak Base is super fast. Where are you playing this weekend or next week? 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, where are we playing next? We are playing, uh, next time we're playing is in Dayton, Ohio, I believe on July 12th. And then we're heading up to the East Coast. Uh, well, we start with uh, Charleston, West Virginia on the 18th, 19th. We are in Washington, D.C. at Gypsy Sally's. And then the 20th, we are in Roanoke, Virginia at Five Point Sanctuary. So see us there. Also, real quick, I want to say, make sure you please follow us on Twitter at Backstage Super. Obviously, the name of the show is the Backstage Supercast, but it's uh, mm-hmm. our Twitter handle is Backstage Super. And Rex will tell you where you can find us on Facebook, too. Uh, we're on Facebook at the Backstage Supercast. Uh, I think the full title is with Freak Base and Rex Division. But if you type out the Backstage Supercast and it doesn't pop us up, then I don't know what to tell you. Um and yeah just uh you know also seriously i I said it once i'll say it again go see freak bass he's amazing i listen to some of his stuff uh it's time to go love you freak talk to you soon brother have a great fourth of july go see spider-man love y'all thanks bye